Okay, um, so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to start this off uh, in our personal discipleship class. I want to give you a few resources for those that would want to go a little bit further, maybe in your own reading time. So these are the, the I say, textbooks for this class. This is required reading for the people who are taking it, but these will be some books that maybe you would enjoy uh, reading uh, that you at least put on a wish list or whatnot. Here are the books, and let me talk to you through them. The first one is by Robert Coleman. It's called The Master Plan of Evangelism. Uh, that is probably one of the top five books I've ever read in my life. Uh, I, I was starting to reread it last night. It's such a powerful, powerful book. The Master Plan of Evangelism, Robert Coleman was a contemporary with Billy Graham uh, during those times. And a lot of times Billy Graham was saying, how do I disciple all these converts? And Robert Coleman was a big part of that as well as Dawson Trump and other ones. There's another one called, uh, by Chuck Lawless called Mentor, which is kind of a, a Bible study book. Chuck Lawless is a uh, professor and, and leading guy, a guy who actually discipled me. Uh, an incredible book there that sort of walks through what it means to mentor someone else spiritually. Um, I don't know, this might make the top five, but this is Donald Whitney called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. If you've ever wanted a resource that tells you what a spiritual discipline is like about how to read the Bible, how to pray, how to fast, this is the book on that, okay? Uh, there isn't even a book that's close to it in my mind as far as spiritual disciplines go. This one is key. It's wonderful. Uh, and I go back to it every couple of years just to, to renew my own heart with it. There's another one called Robert about Robbie Galaxy called Marks of a Disciple, a Biblical Guide for Gauging Spiritual Growth. That is a great resource on discipleship. Um, and then the fifth one is one I finished up last week by Mark Dever called Discipling, How to Help Others Follow Jesus. It's a quick read, about 130 pages. Pages. Small book, but very practical in what it looks like to disciple people within the church. So I gave you the page numbers there for some of you who'd say, all right, I'm not reading that 352 pager. So there's some 130 and some different size there. Uh, but once again, if you ever want uh, the, the classic here for me is Robert Coleman, Master Plan of Evangelism. That is a, was a life-changing book for me when I was in college. And then Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life is very good. The other three are, are as well. You can get all those on Amazon. No, I don't get any money for uh, <laughs> encouraging you to do that. But I do know this. For some of you, if you're going to read, you're going to go over and beyond. I want you reading good stuff, okay? And this is going to be stuff that's going to be going along with what we're talking about on Sunday mornings and on Sunday nights. And so these are some good resources for you. Um, so there we go. Tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, our session one is defining discipleship. As you've got your hand out there, let's just go through a couple of these things uh, because we talk about making disciples, but we know how to do it. In this series of lessons on personal discipleship, let's pray uh, that we start obeying the biblical mandate regarding discipleship. Before we can make a disciple, we need to figure out what one looks like. Does that make sense? Okay. For saying we need to make disciples, we might want to determine what does that look like? What is the end goal? What, is, uh, what are we trying to do here? And so when we think about what is a disciple, let's look at the definition. Uh, in its simplest form, disciple means learner. Okay? In the simplest form of what the word actually means, disciple means learner. Now notice that it doesn't say anything about a learner of spiritual things or learner of the Bible. It just means you're a learner. So does that mean that you can have a disciple of Jesus, but you could also say have a disciple of, name it, <laughs> it this musician, this athlete, this anybody. You can be a disciple of anybody. So even in those days when Jesus started collecting disciples, some of the guys were labeled as a disciple of somebody else. Do you remember who it was? John the Baptist. Hey, he was a disciple of John the Baptist. What does it mean? He was a learner from John the Baptist. Disciple was not a unique spiritual term during Jesus' day. It was used to describe whenever one was learning something from another. So once again, um, in that case, I will say that we probably all have been discipled by a lot of people, and we probably have discipled a lot of people in a lot of different things. Uh, have you ever taught someone some kind of simple skill? That means that they're your disciple in that area, okay? Have you ever learned something from someone like, oh, this is how you, you do this? I can remember um, one day when we were having, uh, we went to a friend's house and they were having a get together and, and the guy at the house decided that he was going to start a bonfire for those who were going to, because his wife said it's important for us to have a bonfire so the kids can make some s'mores out there and he just starts stacking wood just like as, as, as tight as he can, like layered up, not TP format, but just stacking on top or whatever and, and there's no air between it. 
second, there's nothing, and he just starts lighting it. I'm going, do I say anything? Do I not? Whatever. And, and, and so I just I sit there because, I mean, it's, it's his house. I don't want to, you know, upset him or frustrate him. I'm just letting it go a little bit. And, um, and I said, hey, if there's anything I can do to help, you know, I, I'll be over there. And he's like, can you help me start a fire? I said, I sure can. I said, now, <laughs> let, me, let me teach you how to do this, okay? And so I explained to him about, you know, how you got to have some oxygen there. you got to let it breathe a little bit. So let's, let's set it up like a teepee, and let's get a little bit of thing to start a small fire to make it larger fire. And so, and, and then there's a point where I'm saying, hey, now I, I'm doing this, but you come alongside and help me with this. So what was I doing? Well, hopefully the next time that his kids wanted a bonfire, he wouldn't be embarrassed. Okay. Like that, that would be the goal, right? And so in the same way that there are times where it can just be something, you're learning something from another. And so there's, there's a lot of discipleship that goes on in our life, whether or not we even realize it or acknowledge it that. So a working definition for us today is this, the int- uh, of discipleship, the intentional investment of biblical teaching and modeling into the life of another for the sake of Christian maturity. That's going to be our working definition uh, for discipleship. And we can look at those words. They are very uh, specific there. But the first one that I want to point out is the intentional. Um, Can you learn things uh, from people and they're not even trying to teach you stuff? Absolutely. But discipleship, as you see Jesus, I, I was, once again, in Robert Coleman's book, I was reading one of the chapters last night, and, and I thought it was just a beautiful thing. He said there was never a wasted moment in Jesus' life. There was nothing haphazard. He was always on target, always, every conversation, every walk, every stop along the way, everything had an intention about it. And it may look like, oh, they're just doing it. No, no, no. He had a purpose behind it. So it's very intentional. And then it's this investment. He is putting something into people of, I would say, biblical teaching and modeling. And, and the reason why I say this is that if we're not careful, it's very easy for us to make discipleship just to say, well, let me teach you some stuff. I'm going to, like today, this is honestly one of the main reasons why I don't want to teach um, personal discipleship in a, in a group setting like this. Why? Because I'm teaching you by a very bad model. Honestly, I'm here. There's probably about over 100 of you folks today, and I'm trying to teach you to be one-on-one in discipleship. Okay? Now, because we have this format, I'm going to use this, but ultimately, if I want this church to be changed in discipleship, you know what I'm going to do is there's this intentional investment of biblical teaching. Yep, there's this part, but also what? Modeling. I'm showing you how to do something. And you can't really know that unless you're close enough to me, right? You see me. You see how I'm doing things. Same thing as I'll learn to you. So into the life of another for the sake of Christian maturity. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. We'll get to in a couple weeks on Sunday morning. But these verses are incredible. Listen to what it says. It says, we proclaim Jesus, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete or mature in Christ. So it's this picture. I, I love this thought. It's like, what if God had, had, has told me, okay, you've got these little, these little uh, kids in your house. You've got Obadiah, you've got Eli, and you've got Gloria. And you're going to have them for a number of years that live in your house. And at some point, they're going to become independent, right? They're going to leave the nest. And it's almost like that God is saying, at the end of your time with them, can you present them to me and say, all right, God, I, they are now spiritually mature based on what I've done. Now, now, in that, one thing is for my kids, but also what uh, Paul is saying to the Colossian church is, beyond your family, like, we all have people in our spheres of influence that we need to be able to say, for the sake of Christian maturity, I can present these people before God and say, you know what, they're not perfect and neither was I, but I did everything I could so that they were mature, spiritually complete. Now, that is the goal, not converts. More so, how do I make them uh, spiritually mature uh, and going on from that? So that's kind of a definition of disciple. But we look at distinctives and what's different about how we even think about it compared to what Jesus probably meant when he said it. When we think of a student in our context, we automatically envision a classroom setting, right? We're going uh, to teach you something. You're the student. Here's the teacher. We're going to teach you discipleship. We automatically think there's going to be somebody up front. There's going to be people sitting there. You're going to take notes, and we're just going to be completely enlightened, right? Were there ever any courses that you ever took growing up in school that you don't remember? <laughs> okay, now, I know we've got to be careful here, you know, with kids in the room kind of stuff, but how many of you practice trigonometry on a daily basis? How many of you are, are pulling up South Carolina history? How many of you, you know, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's all these things that I sat in a classroom, and I did learn well enough to get a grade to pass and not get in trouble with my mom, right? I did that. I, I got it. 
But because I didn't use it, guess what happens to it? It's gone. It's gone. I mean, listen, there are some things that were gone. If I had a test in first period, it was gone by second period, right? I mean, that's how much I had it. I mean, cram mode, get it in, and all of a sudden it is gone. And so we automatically think of a classroom setting. Now, here's the difference. While classroom learning did exist in that time somewhat, most education was done in a modeling, equipping, and practicing type of environment. There were classroom settings where people would go and they would learn something back in Jesus' day. But ultimately, to be a disciple of someone was very, very different. You got around them, and, and some kind of trade was modeled to you. This is how you do this. And now I'm going to equip you with the tools for you to do it, and now practice it before I let you loose. Um, does anybody remember what Jesus' trade was? What was his job before he started preaching? He was a carpenter. Where did he learn that carpentry from? His dad. It was the family business. So do you think that in those days, and Jesus is in his formative years, okay, that Joseph says, son, you're going to take over the carpentry business when I pass, and so therefore you're going to carpentry school, you know, eight to five, four or five days a week. Is that how it worked? No. Not a chance. What was it? Son, at, at early age, early age, this is a hammer. <laughs> Come here. Let me show you this. You're going to hit this. No, no, no. Calm down. Don't hit it too hard. Let's do it at a good pace here. You want to put, and, and he showed him. Do you think there's probably, this is kind of, I didn't even go in here. There's some times that maybe there were some things, even though Jesus was fully God, that Joseph was saying, son, don't swing that hammer that way. Let me show you how to do it. Yeah. Did Jesus maybe, I don't know, did he probably hit the hammer on his, his finger one time or something? Probably did, okay? He's fully God, but he's fully man, okay? It probably happened. And so what happened? All on the way, Joseph is saying, I'm going to show you how to make this table, all right? I'm going to show you how to make a table. And then all of a sudden, there's going to come this time where I'm going to equip you how to make a table. And then you're going to practice before me. And then ultimately, at some point, whenever uh, Joseph did pass away, I believe that Jesus kept the family business going until age 30 before he set out on his ministry. And you know what? Probably made some of the best furniture you've ever seen in your life. I mean, the best. Why? Because he's been equipped. And he doesn't do anything halfway. <laughs> Nothing. So what, what, there's this picture. So how did Jesus learn carpentry? By sitting under his dad day in, day out. Let me show you how to do this, son. So when his dad's gone, guess what? Jesus can do that. He, he can do this. And so when Jesus says, I want you guys to be disciples of me, guarantee this is the type of learning he's thinking of. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree? It's like, let me come with me. Come. What did he do? He grabbed some disciples and said, what's the first goal? To be with me. That's what he said to Mark. Be with me. That's what I want you to do. Be with me. And do what? Follow me. Watch me. And then eventually, about in a year and a half of his ministry, what does he start doing? Now you guys come here and help. I could feed everybody here, but why don't, I'm going to bless this and you pass out the food to them through your hands. You do this. This is going to be awesome. And then he goes, hey, you guys did great. Wonderful. Now here's what we're going to do. There's some cities over there we haven't got to preach the gospel in, and I want, we're going to go over there. That's great. But we're going to split up in teams of two. Okay? So there's going to be six teams. You go to this city, this city. Jesus, which team are you going on? None of them. I'm going to hang out here. You guys are ready to go. I don't need to walk with you anymore. This is your chance, and I'm going to kick you out of the nest a little bit. And when they came back, they're like, Jesus, you won't believe what happened. He goes, I know what happened. You know what I saw from my side? It's like Satan was falling from the sky. You guys were doing awesome. Way to go. You weren't doing what I have taught you. I've modeled before you. But let's, let's process a little bit more of it because you're going to have to do it a whole lot more soon. <laughs> And let's learn from your, your, your mistakes here. And let's learn from your successes here. And so this is the type of environment these guys were in. The disciple became a follower of the mentor and learned by observing his life up close. That's how discipleship happened. Once again, not even in spiritual terms back then. If you wanted to be a master of whatever it is, you got around the best person you could find and you hung out with them a whole lot. That's how you learned. Um, for many of you... Uh, Let's just, it, whatever it is, I can remember for me, uh, the, I had someone, my, my mom wanted me to take piano lessons as a child because my sister took piano lessons as a child, and that's what you're supposed to do, and I could not stand it. Oh, it, oh, it just killed me. Like, you mean I got to practice so many minutes a week and go and do the kind of stuff like this, okay? And then what all of a sudden I realized was I was able, because of a love for music, I found somebody who played the piano incredibly well. I found somebody who played the guitar incredibly well. And I thought, I want to do it like that. 
And then all of a sudden, I wasn't worried about the discipline of doing this day in and day out or working at it. Why? Because there was somebody that I wanted to emulate. I wanted to play like that guy. I wanted to be able to play like Joey. I wanted to be play like Larry and just pick things up. And I'd go, okay, now the practice is worth it. And so in this, the same kind of concept, disciple, when, when Christ uses these words, he's saying this, you're to be around somebody that you feel like is the master of it, or at least better of it than you are, Right. And you're going to learn from them by being around them. So let's look at what the Great Commission is, because this is sort of where our our homework comes from here. Uh, I've got Matthew chapter 28 is where uh, the Great Commission is is found. Um, But I want, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up and turn there, even though I've got these verses here, because I want us to look back a few different verses. Jesus came into the earth. He was God in the flesh. He lived a perfect life. Um, At age 30, he started out his ministry. Uh, He probably did ministry for about three years at the end of his third year. He was crucified on the cross. He rose from the dead. He hung, uh, after that, he was in and out of the disciples' lives for about 40 days. Then he ascended on a high where he sits at the right hand of God the Father, uh, waiting for his return. And as he's ascending into the Father, this last case of uh, on the 40th day that he's back on earth after the resurrection, um, We'll just go back a couple of verses, but I think this is incredible. Because if you look at uh, Matthew 28, verse 16, there's a haunting even first couple of words there. It says, now the 11 disciples, that's not how you normally heard them. They're normally called the what? 12. 12. Who's missing? Judas is missing because he betrayed Jesus and then, and then hung, him on, hung himself. So, so even that, just a reminder. I mean, I think this is incredible that... This is a hard moment. This is like, we all didn't make it to the finish line together. So now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And there's a couple funny things there. First off, it says that the disciples in verse 17, what's the first verb that we said? When they saw him, they did what? They worshipped him. Um, I was talking with somebody after the first service. If you talk with a Jehovah's Witness and you look at their new world translation Bible, that would not say they worshipped him. It says they gave obeisance to him, which is a big funny word of just saying they revered him instead of worship him because we can't worship Jesus because if we worship Jesus, that means he's God. So they changed this word in the Greek, this proskuneo, which means worship, and every other time it means worship, and they're going to change the word because they don't want you to think that Jesus is to be worshipped. They just revered him and says, hey, you're a great guy. But in this point, what's happening is they are worshiping Jesus, okay? These men who have walked with this man, think about it, they have walked with him for three years. They have slept on the ground together. They have ate meals together. They have been exhausted walking up the trails together for three years. They have seen this man. He's died. He's resurrected to life. And these men are worshiping him. But some did what? Okay, so if you ever feel bad about your doubts, this should give you encouragement tonight, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I can see the, you know, openings in his hands and his sides, this kind of stuff. I don't know if it's him or not. I mean, he's been coming in and out for 40 days, but I'm not sure. And I'm going, if you miss that now, okay, this is, this is pretty intense. But most likely, these are 11 disciples of Jesus, but there's also many other disciples that are around on this mountain watching this, okay? That you know, a lot of times you hear about the disciples of Jesus, but then you hear about the 12 or the 11. So that's probably some of those guys. Some of them are doubting. And then this is what happened. And Jesus came and said to them, and just even that right there, who, who's the one doing the initiating work? Jesus. Jesus is. He came up and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The book's over. Jesus ascends into the sky. And then all of a sudden the book of Acts is going to pop up. Now this is a familiar passage, but I want us to think about a few things to highlight in order to understand Jesus' expectations for discipleship. Number one is this. Jesus is still the initiator. Even in this moment, Jesus is still the initiator. Why that is important is out of there's a, a disconnect. Here's Jesus on the mountain. Here are all these men who love him and adore him and are worshiping him. And yet, who comes up to who? Jesus is still reaching out to them. I'm thinking the disciples be like, the guy who just got up from the dead, let's be near him. And they're like, I don't know. They're kind of standoffish. They're a little unsure. And yet Jesus is coming up to them and he's continuing the conversation. He is the initiator. Can I also say that when we go and make disciples, when we go to the nations, when we go down the road and we think that we are starting a work for God, can I tell you, you're never the one starting it. You're always jumping in where God's already working. 
Always. Always. Um, even if you think, for example, well, I'm the person that's sharing the gospel with this person. This person doesn't know Christ. I guarantee you might be the first time planting a seed. And that, that's a rare occasion for that to happen. It has been for me. If you've ever had the opportunity to share the name of Jesus for the first time before anybody's ever heard it, it's a humbling moment for you. But most likely, most of the conversations we're going to have is we're watering something that's already been planted, right? So, so even in that, you go, wow, Jesus has been reaching out to you. He's been going after you. I always love to think about the story in Luke 19 where Zacchaeus is a little wee little man, right? And he climbs up into the sycamore tree and everybody looks at Zacchaeus and go, wow, that's very impressive. Zacchaeus got up into the sycamore tree so he could see Jesus. And my question has always been, well, who planted the sycamore tree? Right? Did Zacchaeus do that? No. Zacchaeus hadn't planted that sycamore tree 40, 50, 60 years ago. No, no, no. That sycamore tree had been planted by God Almighty to be there at that moment so when Jesus was passing by, Zacchaeus could get a vision of him. That's why. So even when we feel like, wow, somebody's getting a picture of Jesus, I'm saying because Jesus is reaching out. And so that helps us as we go. It's that we're not just doing this on our own. Second thing we see, Jesus has all authority. How much authority? All, all authority. So before we even get into what a lot of times when people will quote the Great Commission, they skip over this section. Uh, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And, and I think that why that's so important is that Jesus is just not some kind of notable prophet that we should go, you've got some good teaching. No, no, no. He's got all authority. Every bit of it. So nothing's going to happen as we go make disciples that he is not sovereign over or in control over. Three, Jesus did not call for the people to come to the church, but for the church to go to the people. He says in verse 19, what's that first word? Go. Um, and quite honestly, for so long, it's very easy for us. But in our church culture, it's been more of a come and see mentality than a go and tell mentality. <laughs> hey, why don't you come over here? We've got a good program for your kids. Hey, come over here. We've got a great music program. Come over here. We've got a pastor that's got a really good beard. Something. We're just come over here, right? Come this way, and you get here, and we'll get you situated. I can't really say anything else good about me, okay? So, so come over this way. Come this way, and you can get it. And, and Christ doesn't say, as you go out, hey, nations, come to these guys. They've got some good stuff. He goes, no, go to them. Go. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your houses. Get out of where you're going. You leave where you are and you go to those places. So when he says go, it's an imperative for us to, to move as well. Number four, Jesus did not ask us to make converts but to make disciples. I mentioned that this morning. Let me just remind you. When he says go, he does not say go and make converts. He says go and make disciples. Can I be honest with you? It's a lot easier to make converts than it is disciples. Um... You can go into certain situations, uh, whether it's kids or adults or whatnot, and it is very easy to emotionally trick people into raising a hand, saying a prayer, making a commitment, and going on from there. Is it not? It's very easy to do that. I, there are a lot of mentalities, a lot of things that people can do that you go, this is very, very easy for us to do to make converts. But to go and make disciples, this is something completely, completely different. So when he says, go therefore and make disciples, once again, he's asking for people to come alongside. Uh, I'll say this, that um, if you think about it, when you think about someone to make convert, obviously that's a big, big step. But that can be done in a moment, Right? Whether it's legitimate or not, it can be done in a moment. Discipleship takes years, years of investment. And so why is it so easy for us to focus on evangelism that we just get somebody that, hey, we had 10 people receive Christ. Well, that's great, but are they growing 10 years later? Are they still there? And so once again, the call is to make disciples. Number five, Jesus will not return until all nations have responded to the gospel. He says, go and make disciples of how many nations again? All nations. Cross references there. Let me give you those. Matthew 24, 14 and 2 Peter 3, 9. This is very huge for us. When he says go and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 24, 14 says this. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached as a testimony in the whole world to all the nations and then the end will come. Okay? So, someone would say, can Jesus come back today? Well, he can come back, I guess, whenever he wants to. But he's promised in his word He's not coming back until every nation at least has a chance to respond.
Mm -hmm. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about His promise, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come repentance. So why are, is the only reason why, and there are times where I go, Lord Jesus, come and fix what's broken. He's going, I am not coming back due to grace because I want them to have a chance to respond to the gospel. Now, with this, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can consider this. So for me, we can look at right now our maps, and, and, and Pastor David could give you the maps of how many unreached people groups there are. International Mission Board's looking as we give to Lottie Moon. We're trying to get these people out there. And yet we go, well, I guess he's not coming back tomorrow because there's something like 2,000 unreached people groups out there left. Okay? And yet some people will push back and say, well, some of those unreached people groups 500 years ago were reached. There was a Christian in that area, but it, it died there. It never went further. And so has the gospel reached all people? I don't think it's reached all people just yet. I think we're getting closer. But Jesus has said this, you go and you make disciples of all nations. And these verses are saying he is delaying his return out of grace towards these people so they at least get a chance to hear. And so as we go, we are remembering that. Uh, number six. The mandate for baptism reveals the external evidence of a life change and commitment to the church. When he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So he's telling them to baptize. So when we look at this, obviously this is a uh, wonderful symbol, but it is a symbol, right? Does baptism save you? No. no. Uh, does baptism, all right, let me ask you this. Should baptism come before conversion or after conversion? After conversion, right? So Christ changes your life, and now you get up in front of people and say, Hey, y'all, I want to let you know my life just got changed. And so when I'm going down the waters, it's like I'm dead in my old ways, and I'm coming back because he's brought me back to life. And I want all of you to see that. Why? Because I belong to him now. Great example of the wedding band. Uh, if I take this wedding band off, does that mean that I'm no longer married? Nope. If I put this wedding band on one of you guys right now, does that mean you're married to Amanda? Absolutely not. It does not, okay? <laughs> but what this does is when I put this on, it's showing to other people I belong to somebody. Follow me? Baptism is a lot like that, okay? It's not making you anything that you're not. But what it's doing is it's showing a people, let me give you a sign, I belong to someone here. And so why was this so important? Why would he say in the Great Commission? I mean, because I'll, I'll ask you another question, okay? And, and you're going to answer this one, but do you have to be baptized to get to heaven? No. No. I would say no. I'll give you an example why. Um, two thieves on the cross, remember those next to Jesus? One of them says, hey, when you go into your kingdom today, will you remember me? And Jesus says what? If you get baptized, yes. <laughs> right? No. He says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in where? Paradise. Paradise. Didn't get a chance to get baptized, didn't join a church, never uh, gave a tithe in his life. I guarantee that. But I believe with everything within me, he is in heaven right now. Okay? So with that, though, so why is this so important as he's going to make disciples of all nations? This symbol was a symbol to say, we belong to one another. This is not something. Yes, this is a commitment that you make to God. But all the commitments also in God are not only for me, it's for us. So why is baptism so important? Because Jesus knows you cannot make it on your own. So there's going to be a church element of this, a people of God element. You get baptized. So sometimes somebody asked me one time, they said, can I get baptized? I'm, I'm older in my life and I didn't get baptized earlier and I'm kind of embarrassed to do it. Can you just come to my house and baptize me in my bathtub? The answer is that that would be no, okay? Because it's it's a public declaration. It's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be in front of people to say, I belong to him and to you, and to you. And so once again, there's this evidence of a life change. It's a commitment to the church. It's so important. Jesus is going, don't just go and make disciples who are disciples all by their lonesome. They make them a part of this family uh, and make it evident. Number seven, disciples are followers of Jesus who obey biblical instruction. They are followers of Jesus who obey biblical instruction. What does verse 20 say? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. I wish Jesus would say, teach them to obey some of what I've commanded you, <laughs> right? A couple of major things. But he says, no, no, no. You teach them to observe everything I've commanded. Has Jesus um, commanded some pretty difficult things? Absolutely. How do you make disciples? Well, first off, you've got to teach them those things, right? And second of all, you've got to teach them to obey those things. Um, can I tell you, there? I believe there's a difference between what I would call ignorance and stupidity, Okay. Ignorance is, I just didn't know. 
right? Uh, there have been times in my life where it's an expectation of you're supposed to go do this, and I just literally had no idea that was the expectation. Now that I know, I can do it. But sometimes I'm going, you never told me. You know, I, I didn't know. Stupidity is, I knew it. I just don't care, and I'm going to do my own thing, right? There, there is a difference. And so, so sometimes I believe in the church, there are some people who've just never been taught certain things. They just don't know. Now, there's a difference when you know and you just disobey. But he's saying, no, you teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. And then in the discipleship process, Jesus assures them with the greatest resource imaginable. That is his presence. He says, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Some of you have the New American Standard Translation, which says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's why a friend of mine will not get in a plane, because he says that Jesus says he's with him low and not high. Okay, so... <laughs> That's just the way he goes, okay? I don't believe that's what it means, but it means, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Isn't it beautiful that when Jesus comes in the incarnation, they said, hey, here's going to be a nickname for this boy. His name's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. And when he goes up into the sky, what's he saying? And listen, when you go do this work, don't worry, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. That promise of Emmanuel is so, so sincere in this. And I believe so much so when we are replicating what we've got, guess what? Think about it. I, I wish that right now if it, that we could trace the line that goes all the way back to what Jesus has done, okay? And, and the reason why I say that is, um, for many of you, uh, some of you love genealogies and studying your family tree, right? And you're studying this person and this person and this person, this kind of stuff, and, and trying to figure all that out. It's a wonderful thing. But sometimes I just think about the lines of connection, that even ultimately, that at the Great Commission, some of what you have learned in church, okay, even today, what we're learning right now, all stem from one man telling 11 disciples what to do. Think about that. I mean, Jerusalem... To Greenville. 2,000 years later, language barriers, ethnicity barriers, socioeconomic barriers, time, culture changing, and yet we still can't get over what he said. Why? Because he told 11 ragtag guys, do this and teach somebody else. The only reason we even have this in our hands to open up today is because they were faithful to what he called them to do. Why? Because he was with them always, even to the end of the age. And so what's beautiful here is, so you mean if we go all the way back and think through, okay, well, Jesus did this here and this, and, and there's a chain reaction that causes us to right here, think about it this way. How we live our lives hundreds of years from now Generations from now, in different cultures, people could be impacted by what we do here today. It's amazing to me. Um, we were uh, on a trip to Africa years ago, and uh, I was in a um, in a house that we were when we were about to go back to the um, back to the states. And I can remember uh, we were sitting there with our missionary, and, and somebody told us, "Hey, this is the house that the mission board has bought." for this family that's coming in, and they, they said the name, the last name, and I said, hey, can you tell me the first names? And they said, oh, so-and-so and so-and-so. Well, I knew this couple, like, very well. And I thought, really? And he's like, yeah, they're going to live here um, and in this house, actually, in a few months. And I was like, that's just incredible. And I don't know why, but that night, as I was just sitting there, I can remember a conversation that one of those missionaries, okay, they're a couple now, they've got a few kids, that one of those missionaries had called me probably 15 years before that moment, okay? And was about to get married to somebody that is not their spouse now, okay? And they were about to get married to this person. And a lot of their family and friends did not think this was a godly person that they needed to get married to. And they called me getting close to their wedding day and said, tell me the truth. Am I making a bad decision by marrying this person? I know you'll be honest with me. Tell me regardless of how that makes me feel. And I said, I love you, but you need to end this relationship now. And you do not need to get married to this guy. And she just starts to weep on the phone, and she gets overwhelmed, and she goes, what am I going to do? And I said, you're going to cry for about two weeks straight, and then you are going to get better. I said, it's going to be really bad for the, especially the next week, but it will get better. And I said, I want you to persevere through this. And so she ended the relationship and the engagement, embarrassed herself, upset a lot of people, all these kind of different things. And then about 15 years later, I'm, I'm finding out that her and her spouse and their kids are about to move in this missionary house. You know, and, and in that moment, once again, it was, okay, when you're going, wow, Travis, you did a noble thing. All I said was dump him. Okay, that's all I said, okay? <laughs> but think about this. There were literally children about to walk in that house that wouldn't be in existence. Okay, think about that for a second. 
She wouldn't have been on the mission field. He wouldn't have been on the mission field. They were going to be in different places. And now there's actually human beings that are breathing. And, and that night, I really do feel like God was just saying, Hey, son, you see what you get to be a part of when you just stay faithful in the small stuff? Nobody's going nobody's to ever see this, but just realize they're about to move into this house and share the gospel in this country that you'll never live in. And it wouldn't have happened if you would have told them what they wanted to hear in that moment. And I, I just remember thinking, like something so small, a phone call. Literally, Amanda can remember the time when I'm saying, hey, I'll be in the store in a second. Just hold on, dump him. You need to dump him now. Okay, and then we go in. Small thing. It took about 15 minutes. I'm going, look, look at the difference that, that made. And so I'm saying is that what we're doing, God's presence is with us, and it is changing people, changing cultures, changing, I mean, all types of chain of reactions as we think about. And so it's so very important as we think through it. The six components in the life of a disciple. We talked about this this morning, um, and I do apologize. I just try to get too much in one sermon. So I, I know I ran through this last stuff here today. But what are the greatest components that made you who you are today? What is your faith story? Most likely, your summarized testimony would include many, if not all, of these elements. So here's what I want us to do. I want you right now, as we just go through this, I want you to think for a moment, what is that event or events in your life that has significantly changed your testimony. Do you have a milestone in your life when the gospel changed you? Okay, It can be a revival meeting. It can be a trip. It can be something that happened that was bad. But I want you right where you are. Okay, We're not going to like turn these in. But I want you just to write key words underneath that number one there. What are some events in your life that you thought, man, these are foundational for me. These were game changers for me as I followed Christ. I want you just to sort of jot those down really quick. One or two things that you would say, this is a milestone in my life when the gospel changed me. As you're thinking through that, how many of you would say, uh, you're not going to tell us what those are, but how many of you with one of those milestones in the last five years, raise your hand, last five years. Okay, great. How many of you, your milestone happened over 30 years ago? Raise your hand. Some of you are like, I got to get the calculator out. Hold on. Okay, right. Okay. But so, so you see this, that some of us are right now walking with a milestone that happened recently. Some of us a long time ago. Is it still changed who we are today? Yeah. Absolutely. You go back and you see through biblical characters in our own life, there is a moment where God got our attention that changed everything. Uh, second thing, environment. What regular faith gatherings are shaping who you are today? Or let me also say, back tomorrow. In your most critical time of growth, okay, the time where you grew the most, what was that gathering that changed you? Was it a church service you went to, a youth group, a Bible study, an accountability group? I want you real quick, just jot down keywords there. What are some of the regular faith gatherings that shaped who you are today or are currently shaping you now? Number three, example, who is the mentor you aspire to follow? I want you to write down just the first name of somebody who just impacted you for Christ that you just looked up and said, I want to be like that. They're, 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 they're the example. They're the standard for me. If you have that person or two, I want you to just write that first name down really quick. Number four, encourager. Who is the friend walking beside you and pushing you towards Christ? If you look back over your life, who is that consistent person? Think about it. Not above you, but beside you in that journey. Follow me? Who was that friend that pushed you along, uh, that helped you out walk in Christ to, to grow in Christ? Write a couple of names down. First names really quick. Number five, equipment. What spiritual disciplines are, are, are training you to grow in godliness? What was it that maybe you started doing that made a difference in your life? Was it reading the Bible? Was it praying? Was it uh, fasting? Was it giving? What was it? What are some disciplines that you'd say? Just write the key words down. And number six, engagement. How are you intentionally investing in another with what you have learned? 
Was there ever a moment where you started serving or teaching or leading someone else or a group of someone else's that made a difference for you that you thought for the first time, wow, God can use me? Okay, so just think about it may be a person, it might be a group, it might be some type of event, but was there something where you started not receiving but giving back? Uh, just write sort of those key words down. All right, as you get those six down, here's, here's what I, I'm determining, okay? Um, if I were to give you my story, here's, here's the summary version. The event in my life that if I think through, there was the uh, divorce of my parents that caused me to wake up and realize just how things can get in life and really caused me at an early age to think about sin. There was a gospel encounter at age seven that really I remember receiving the gospel and talking to the pastor. I really need to receive the gospel. There was a call to ministry at age 14 that I remember sitting on a beach and God saying, you will serve me. And I'm going, what am I going to do? And he's going, you will figure it out. And I, I can remember pivotal moments for me. If I think about environments, those regular faith gatherings are shaping who I am today. I think the biggest thing for me would probably be um, a small group of guys that I started having Bible study with in college. That for me, I, I grew so much during that time because it was a regular time where we got very uh, specific with one another, very accountable with one another. An example who is the mentor you aspire to follow, there were people in my college and seminary days that I would say, can I just go with you, drive you to the airport? Can I go with you while you go buy groceries? I will come to your house at 6 in the morning if I have to sit, just sit there and see you do a quiet time. There are people like Adrian and Chuck and different ones that I can think of. I just wanted to be around and just learn from, and I thought I've never heard anybody talk or live like that, and it just changed me. Uh, the encourager uh, along the way, there's obviously been accountability partners that I've had throughout college. In fact, my accountability partner right now is still the guy that was my roommate in college, and we call every, uh, every Wednesday morning, and we ask each other some tough questions and we push one another to try to push each other on. Uh, also a great encourager for those that are married and when you are married you have a built-in accountability partner at the house, right? It's always there. That's a good thing. Equipment, spiritual disciplines for me, while I love a lot of different spiritual disciplines, the one when I started memorizing scripture in college, it changed my life and caused me to want to know God's word more and it changed everything. And the engagement, how are you intentionally investing in another what you've learned? I can remember in college when I started having those opportunities, but I think specifically the first time somebody looked at me in Tokyo, Japan, and I was giving them a gospel presentation. And when they said, who is Jesus? They never heard the name. Everything changed for me. You know, and that's when, and now as I'm trying to pour into other people. And so, so when I look at that, here's the thing. Uh, some of you, let's be honest, there were some of those numbers that were harder for you to come up with than others. Is that fair? Okay. Um, there are probably some that were very, very simple, easy, and there are some like, uh, not exactly sure. Now, what I know is there's probably some similarities on our list, but there's also some very big differences here. Now, some of this stuff, I would say, in some ways you can't help, and in some ways you can Right? Uh, for some of you right now, I I'll be honest, I think there are a lot of people right now who are looking for a spiritual father or mother figure. Desperately. A lot of people say, oh, everybody in church wants to have somebody their same age. No, they don't. <laughs> so many people are wanting somebody older and wiser than them and who've been through where they're about to go and say, make sure I don't make bad calls. Will you teach me along the way? And so for a lot of us, we may see some things that we need. And so it's probably obvious when you look at that list, maybe an area that you need to focus on, is it not? You look at it and go, okay, if this one is a little bit vacant here, then maybe you need to start thinking about this area. And how would you go about as you encourage and how you continue to move on? Here's a way I want us to sort of end tonight in this devotion, doctrine, and discipline um, aspect. That if you were responsible to mature someone in Christ, where would you begin? Okay? So if I came to you and I said, hey, got this new Christian here, just received the gospel, and they need somebody to disciple them, you're it. See you in three years. Tell me how he comes out. Okay? What would you do? <laughs> and it can't be, Pastor Travis, here you go. <laughs> Can you meet with him? Okay? Um, it would be, no, no, no. Like, you were completely responsible. Nobody else is going to inform them, pour into them spiritually. What would you do? Okay? Now, on some level, uh, depending upon how you're wired, some of you are automatically thinking, all right, twice a week we're going to meet at this time and we're going to go through this study and it's going to be da 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 da, da. And some of you are like, ah, I don't get in all that detailed stuff. We're just going to hang out and they're going to learn from me, right? And there's probably some beauty to both of those and both of those need to happen. Um, 
I am giving you a list of information that some of you are going to write down and you're going to lose this sheet of paper within 48 hours. Don't even act like that ain't true. Okay, some of us in this room or, or maybe that's how we're going to hold on to. Some of you have a notebook at home that you have kept every single one of these you have gotten over the last 50 years, okay? And your spouse is saying, we don't have any more room. You're going to have to get rid of some of these, right? Okay, so with that, some of you are wired that way, but also um, a lot of us are going to sort of forget this information, but ultimately it's going to come down to that life on life and we're learning. And so if I'm saying if you're responsible to mature someone in Christ, where would you begin? All disciples should be aiming to have similar devotions, doctrinal stances and spiritual disciplines, but we are not all on the same place in the journey. Some of us need to focus on certain elements that others don't have to worry about as much. So what I mean by that is this. Have you ever known anybody who knows the Bible in and out, is a biblical scholar, can quote to you all these scripture passages, can tell you about what the original language is of this, they got a study Bible about this big, and they're not the most godliest person you've ever met in your life? You ever been around that person? Don't point fingers if they're in here, okay? But just asking you a question. So let me ask you, can you have biblical knowledge and it not be fleshing itself out into maturity in life? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, let me ask you another question. Have you ever known somebody who really loves Jesus and is a very genuine person, but they've never really learned the biblical uh, truths? They're just good. They're not really as hot-tempered. They're just sort of calm, meaner, but they're not really in the scriptures. And so you start asking them questions. They go, I don't know. I mean, I guess there are other ways to heaven. And you go, whoa. And, and you realize they're godly, but they don't have this. So, so here's the thing. If we just, once again, think about the conveyor belt analogy. We stick everybody on the same conveyor belt and expect by the end of a year or three years, everybody's going to be at the same place. Guess what? Some of us are going, but you haven't addressed where my need is right now. Follow me? Okay, so some of us, we'd say, if we go through a, a session on anger, all right, well, 7% of you go, good, that's exactly what I needed. And some of you would say, I mean, I struggle in areas, but that's not one of them. I don't really get hot-tempered. And so, so why I'm saying this is that this approach we're talking about is not cookie cutter. And that's what makes it so frustrating, okay? Uh, how many of you that have had multiple children living in your house realize they all don't come in the world the same, right? <laughs> Are their temperaments different? Do how they learn different? Certain discipline work on some and doesn't work on the other. Certain encouragement works on some, doesn't the other. Some get this easy, some don't. And you go, oh, I'm just going to use the same approach on all of them. Well, good luck. <laughs> Somebody's going to punch a hole through a wall. Okay, before all this is said and done, it's going to be frustrating. And so with this, you have to look at a person and say, okay, if this is the body, soul, spirit, mind, this is the disciple, and I go this. They are very good here, here, here. We don't have to address that. But this, we got to get on right away. You following me? So now the only way you can do that is if you are close enough to see that person. So, so if you had to come up with a list of what a disciple's devotion, doctrine, and discipline should look like, what would you include? Now, here's something that I've been playing around with in my head for the last year. And uh, this kind of scares me, this approach, but also I think for some of you right now, this might help. Because if I were to give you right now, okay, let me just say, some of you are saying, I buy into this, I'm all for it. Can you please give me the list of 21 things that somebody needs to know before they can go, check, you're a disciple, right? Some of you are thinking, that list is coming, right, Travis? Mm, maybe, okay. But not, it's not that easy. You know why it feels that easy? Guess where we would find that list? Wouldn't that be wonderful, you list people? Jesus, just tell me the 12 things they need to know and the six things they need to do, and I'm, I'm done, right? Check. And, and it's not going to be that easy. But I think for some of us, we need to come up with, in our mind, that if you had this formal person who said, I've just received the gospel and I want somebody to disciple me, and I say that I gave you three years, or I've just given you one year, your job is to follow around the edges, to find the rough spots, to work in those areas that are incomplete, and your job, only your job, figure it out. What were the things that you would in your mind go, okay, they need to, if we look at it, what are the devotion what are those devotion, that heart aspect, the, the kind of focus and commitment that I would want to see in them? And say, yep, okay, I feel pretty good. Not that they're perfect, but they got those things down. What are the doctrinal things that they need to understand? Okay. Do they need to know the difference between a burnt offering and a peace offering? Maybe. <laughs> Do they need to know that Jesus is the only way into heaven? Most likely, yes, right? So, so but what are those things that you would want to make sure that they knew, okay, their, their, their doctrine? But then discipline, what are those things that you would want them to do? 
Okay, as a result, what would you want to say? Before I could say, I could send this disciple on his way, what are those things in my life that I'd be able to say, I feel good that you know how to do this right here and right now. And so here's what I want you to do. Uh, I want you, in just a moment, we're going to look. You see on your list there, it says, what should be a disciple's devotion? What is necessary for a disciple's doctrine? And what should be included in a disciple's discipline? Okay, so when you think about, basically, uh, heart matters, mind matters, and kind of action matters. Okay, think about it that way. What are some things that you would think these are kind of important? So, like, let's just give an example for should be included in a disciple's discipline. I think here's one that I would say is important for someone to know how to do. I think to be able to share the gospel with someone else is an important thing that you'd want to do, right? So I'm going to go ahead and give you an answer to number three. Share the gospel with somebody else. That would be one on my list that I would say, I think that if I could say this person is complete in Christ, they would need to know what those things are. So what I want to do is I want to give your table uh, an opportunity to flesh out some of these ideas, okay? So I'm going to give you about two minutes on each item, and I want you just to go and sort of give some ideas about what some of those things might be. All right, let me ask you something. I want you to look at your list on one, two, and three, and I know this is rapid fire, not a whole lot of time, but you probably, did you get some good answers there? Okay, let me ask you something. You don't have to tell what it is, but was there something that somebody said that you thought, ooh, I need to learn that too? Was there some of that probably? You're like going, you know... All right, I'm good on some of this, but I probably could learn. Okay, so, so even inside, I would like to say at some point that we could say, you know, you're growing and you're mature, but are there things that we need to strengthen ourselves in? Yeah. Absolutely. So there are disciplines that I can find somewhat easy. And I'll tell you one that I just thought about, uh, I guess, a few months ago. That I thought, you know, I, I just, I don't fast as often as I think Jesus would have me fast. Because Jesus says, when you fast... He doesn't act like if, he says when. And I thought, you know, when am I going to get around to, I'm going to just abstain from food because I love Jesus so much, right? I'm going to have to make myself do that. I'm going to have to, I'm going to decide, I'm going to have to do that. So I found this area in my life said, okay, I need to work on that. And you know one of the main reasons I need to work on that? Because I'm probably going to show somebody else how to do that one day. It's, it's very easy for me to sort of pass by that, but I need to work this in me. So as you're looking at this, this is literally just a starting, a launching pad. And what we're going to do next week is we're going to jump in even more into some of these kind of things to say, okay, if you were, if I said, here's this person, your job to disciple them, what are the things that you would want to cover? And as you start identifying, it's very obvious, but you'll start talking to somebody and you can go, okay, check, they're good here, they're good here. Not perfect, but they're doing well. But these are those areas that we need to work on. Inside ourselves, do we need that? Absolutely. But also it helps us to direct to see some of those things. I think one of the most beautiful ways of discipleship a lot of times is we see someone struggling in an area that guess what? We struggled into. Isn't that beautiful? You're not alone. You're not weird. But let me help walk through it. I'm not there yet, but we're getting there. And so, so here's my prayer. Honestly, I'm going to just go throw this out here. That as we continue to walk through this, the more that we get together, I'm hoping that our times even around the table are going to grow, okay? And sort of just go ahead and warn you that there's going to be a lot more interaction and learning from one another, helping train us so that we can go out and do it out there with other folks. And so, Father, I just ask tonight that as we come uh, to this place and just maybe start thinking about what your commission is to go and make disciples of all nations, Lord, that you would cause that those things that have been invested in us, whether intentionally or we've just caught alongside the way, there are so much wealth of information, experience, and knowledge in this room. It's baffling. Lord, if we could just bottle up what was available in this room but through what we've experienced walking with you, um, there are people around the world that would just die to have that education, die to have that modeling, die to have that opportunity to learn. And so, Lord, uh, even though we may not feel like we have something to offer, we have much to offer because we've learned a lot from you and from your word and through experience. And, Lord, it doesn't need to just end with us. We need to share it with someone else. So, Lord, I pray that even this very week, that it maybe as we go back home and think through this list a little bit more, Lord, I pray that your spirit would um, have our radar up as we are about this week and looking for people alongside that we can teach. And maybe it's just a few minutes here or there. Maybe it's someone that's a little bit longer, but we just see someone who's in need that we can say, you know what? Not that I have it all together, but I want to be able to imitate Christ and allow this person to imitate me as we do it. And so, Lord, teach us what it means to make disciples. We want to fulfill your commandment. Please teach us, God. In Jesus' name, amen.